Good morning, wonderful people. Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee. I am here with Uplift Greg, who is going to... You can to... say my real name if you want. It's not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> Hi, Greg. We're going <laughs> to hang out and talk a little bit about um, how to spot disinformation, misinformation, and figure out if your news source is legitimate. And I expect that I'm going to learn a lot. I think I'm wow. pretty good at this, but I know I know Greg's taking it to the next level just based on experience. So, yeah. Okay, first of all, you're you're way smarter than you give yourself credit for, and so oh, th this is fair. this is really just about being uh, uh, being careful. It's it's about being open minded about who might be trying to influence your opinion. So that's the first thing. Okay, so who <laughs> who is trying to influence my opinion? And right how do now, I tell today, if they are? Uh, yeah. I I would guess that for, first of all, let's the obvious answer. Uh, maybe it's less not is the Ukrainian government. Okay. You know, the, the Ukrainians are, are they have <laughs> clearly they have a, a motivation to get you to post things that uh, tell their story mm -hmm. and that uh, give you their point of view. Um, and, it, you know, I know everybody thought I was going to say Russia and it's like, no, duh. Right. But it, for instance, the, the casualty figures every day, Ukraine is posting the number of Russian soldiers they've killed or captured the number of tanks they've destroyed aircraft they've destroyed. And the first thing is in any military conflict the first thing you do is cut those numbers in half right because when you're reporting on the enemy casualties you know you're you're you first of all you're optimistic you believe your forces are going to do a better job than the other guys and then secondly th they may pad the number anyway because they want to they want the russians to think we're killing a lot of your guys you need to back off um, both sides are doing that but it might surprise some folks to find out that ukraine is probably doing that as well. So, um, the Ukraine, Russia, the, the United States is probably trying to steer some opinions. And, and I'll give you a really good for instance of that. Um, the, uh, the, the Putin's lost his mind. Putin, Putin is mil is mentally different now than he was two years ago. The, that's the kind of thing that disinformation is designed to, uh, to increase or decrease, right? Play up or play down. And, and I, I've seen a real uptick in the last 10 days of those stories, you know, where, and some of these, the people that are saying these things, I, I have to tell you that, you know, from my knowledge of how intelligence communities work and espionage works, um, you think for a minute about when you see, uh, when you look back at stories about famous serial killers who have been caught, sometimes the FBI would, in their profile, or in their their attempts to draw a killer out to contact them or to talk to the media, would say things like, "Well, we think he's impotent," right? Which you know that may be part of the profile, but the reason you release that is because you want the person to react to that. You want them to try and contact you to argue that that's not true, or you know the the killer may be you know whatever. It is. So I think in a way that's what they're doing with Putin right now. They're trying to shape the idea that he's madman, that he's lost his mind. That doesn't help us win a war. It doesn't help Ukraine win a war, but it might make it more likely that someone within Putin's inner circle takes him out of the equation. So that's an example of, of how misinformation is, is real and, and useful in a time of war. And we are literally in a digital war right now. That's, uh, that's been going on probably since 2012, 2014. Uh, with Russia specifically, they've attacked, as you know, our presidential candidates. They've attacked our policies. They've attacked our allies and our alliances. Uh, and they've done it using some people that should have fucking known better, frankly, uh, like the last guy that sat in the White House. Um, why do you think he was anti-NATO? Why do you think he was trying to fracture that alliance and make it more difficult for us to participate with NATO? That was to facilitate the kind of actions that we're seeing in Ukraine that we saw in Georgia, that we saw in Crimea, that we saw in and, and, and. Do I think that he's, you know, that, that, that uh, Trump was maybe aware of that? I think that's possible, but there's a, uh, there's a phrase in espionage called being a useful idiot. Someone doesn't have to be a knowing participant in espionage to be helpful to your cause. And I think that might be where, uh, where Trump's usefulness was. So I've just outed my politics in the first five minutes of the show. Let's get that right out in the open. That All I think right. he was a, an asset and maybe not even willingly of uh, Russian propaganda. So, 
this is this is good to have out in the open because it's something that's come up in the news a fair bit and the you know the immediate next question is if he's praising them but nobody else really is except some people are there are a couple couple nations that are mm -hmm. then who are we looking to for reliable neutral news is there any reliable neutral news i think there is and, and i think even if, this is the other thing um neutral is a problematic ex expectation from journalists because if you're on the ground and what you're seeing or you're 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 in a war theater and what you're seeing is 10,000 dead ukrainians and no dead russians right and you're in ukraine and they are yeah. the victim of an attack how can you be neutral in that the reality yeah. is a massive military force has invaded a country that gave up its nuclear arsenal so that it would never be attacked or manipulated by either side. It's hard to be, I can't, I don't think neutral is the right outlook in that situation. You know, well, maybe Ukraine was asking for it. Uh, no, yeah, no, I don't think so. And and we wouldn't say that about a person, right? No. So, so we, you know, you see my point that uh, so I, don't, I don't think neutrality is what we should be seeking. Accuracy is what we should be seeking. So that's yeah. a better question is, you know, who do we count on for accurate information? And my fundamental response to that is first thing, mainstream credentialed journalists, because by training, you know, that's their goal is to give you yeah. accurate information as far as they can gather it. Um, and the, the I, I, I get like, I get tense so shoulders. Well, oh, this is just the media. No, no, this is, you know, when you, when you turned on NBC news two weeks ago or CNN or, uh, you know, any other reputable credentialed news agency two, three weeks ago, and they were telling you the number of military units that were lining up on the border of, of uh, Ukraine. I really did hear some people in our political structure and in our media structure say, well, it's just the media trying to start a war. No, that's not how this is working. Uh, R Russia is <laughs> planning a war. And what you're seeing is people reacting to and reflecting that fact uh, for you, for your consumption. I know personally uh, some very good journalists and 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 they you know you should know first of all that a real journalist struggles with this like how much do we daily tell people, right? uh how much uh, you know how much do i want to get spit on when i go to rallies covering the other side in any in any uh, uh news story or, or shot yeah. at literally shot at so um so that um but mainstream credentialed media sources or or, or, or journalistic sources major newspapers major tv news networks be they uh, you know, be they uh, AFP, Agency Free Press France, BBC in England, very fair and, you know, and, and, and accurate coverage. Um, our, our major American networks, CNN, uh, NBC, ABC, CBS, these are, these are real news organizations. And I think something that some people don't get sometimes, it's not like a, a, a writer for a major newspaper can just write it whatever they want and it goes to publish. Right? One no. of the things that happens, there's an editorial process where an editor is trying to slow them down and make sure that they, they fact check, back check everything. You have to have more than one source to report as fact anything that you report. And if they don't, the next level of control is the lawyers of the publishers. Because if you do report something that turns out to be uh, made up or spurious or fr not sourced, you can and will be sued and you will lose. So lots of people's jobs are on the line. When you read something in a paper like the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Miami Herald, the Chicago Tribune, uh, um, uh, the, you know, dare I say it, uh, what's the, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, a fairly conservative newspaper in Canada that used to deliver the National, National the Review? Post? No. Uh, National, National Post? Post, right? National Post, right? These are credential journalistic organizations and they can be sued if they get it wrong and that's we've seen tv news anchors in america lose their jobs over getting sucked into a story that was made to trip them up and so that's you know that's the first line of people that you should be following on twitter and count on when you see it there that it's sourced that they have a source they usually have more than one source and they can provide it in writing if people ask now this whole oh these are unnamed sources right they're unnamed until we get to court in the lawsuit so you can count on the fact that those sources are real if it's in the newspaper or on your tv news um with a few notable exceptions so uh that's the why why is fox news not on the tv in canada 
because they can't pass the stringent uh, journalistic credentialing that Canada requires and we don't. Yeah, there's the thing about that. Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting that you're talking about sources and credentialing because that is a very, very big deal. And protection of sources is also a very big deal. And you can, if you are telling your source that they're going to be anonymous unless you get dragged to court, you have to uphold that. Um, and at least in Canada, that when back when I went to journalism school, there was some sort of legal precedent for keeping them anonymous. That's right. Um, so as a journalist, you are actually legally bound to keep a source anonymous if you say you're going to. Right. And the, by the way, anonymous means anonymous to the public. Yes. Um, the editor often almost always knows who the source is. Like the, yep. the journalist that wrote it has to tell his editor or editorial board uh, who it is. And th th that decision is made above their level. But to, to get people to talk about something that may actually endanger them, you often have to give them that anonymity protection to the extent that you can. Journalists here have been jailed uh, over not revealing their sources in the past. That's a thing that really happens to journalists. And nobody wants yep. to go sit in jail for 60 or 90 days. So, um, And it's for the duration, by the way. When, when a judge finds you in contempt for not revealing a source, um, there's no sentencing length there. You're going to be in jail until you tell them who the source is or something else happens in court. So it's a big deal. It really is. Uh, um, now, as far as what happens in, you know, what we would call new media or social media like Twitter, um, there's a there's a there's an art to making sure that what you're what you're following is accurate. And when I set up this little group on Facebook, um, I in the first month or two of learning about um, about a uh, a part of this called OSINT or open source intelligence gathering, there are people nerds like me who spend a lot of time reading about weapon systems and deployments and, and capabilities and, uh, and activities of militaries around the world. My, well, some of them don't even focus on military things. Some of them focus on business or finance things. Uh, but I read a lot, of, a lot of folks that actually, they spend their time, you know, uh, let's just say that Russian state media, TASS, publishes a picture of a new Russian tank, which they'll do because they want the Russian people to go, look, our strong military. Uh, they'll they'll take the picture of that tank and start uh, people that are very knowledgeable about tanks and developments. Well, look, this new tank is different than this old tank because it has this kind of a gun and it has this kind of track system and motor. So there are people that spend their time uh, just sussing out what the capabilities of these weapon systems or, or even ships or militaries or systems are, and they'll publish those. So following those folks... Uh, allows for um, a thing to happen like a journalist will say I just saw a Russian tank in this location and there's a picture well some of these sleuths go into the picture and find the uh, the geolocation data that's buried in the in the file when you take a picture on your phone or with an SLR it actually records where it was taken like a, a, a lat launch cord or a GPS coordinate and when it was taken so open source intelligence has busted the Russians now multiple times uh, showing pictures of, of attacks by the Ukrainians that were taken three months ago in a forest uh, not in Ukraine. So, so those are the people that I follow. That's the people that I'm, you know, when I see a picture of carnage or damage in Ukraine, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting that Intel crab, one of the guys I follow, you know, geolocated. And he'll often, in a thread about the photo, there will be a picture of the geolocation and you can literally match up what's in the photograph with what's on the, the Google map. You can see this this cornfield or that big uh, water tower. And that's been fascinating to me that these are people that are, you know, hobbyists, uh, essentially, or retired professionals that know where to go to get the information. Um, one of the most difficult things, one of the most interesting and difficult things is tracking military aircraft because they, in, in a war zone, in a battle space, they fly without transponders. But when they're not in the battle space, they have their transponders on. So you can tell a lot about what's going to happen uh, by seeing what's active and how much surveillance activity is going on with aircraft that have transponders in them right now over Poland and the rest of, of, of Central Europe. There is a lot of, of tankers and observation aircraft and, and uh, surveillance drones. There is a lot of traffic, and that wasn't true 30 days ago. So you can see 
uh, what's coming by where things are moving. So I kind of wandered off there. I like that. And that's really interesting. And I like the bit about the geolocation in the photos too, because that's particularly important when people are making things up and believing that you'll just look at the picture and go with it. Right. We, we, so, within an hour of, uh, I'm trying to specifically the first, the first thing I saw like that, uh, within an hour of, uh, the first time Russia said that the Ukrainians had fired on them they posted a photograph of a burning uh, Russian armored vehicle. And that photo was taken three weeks before, you know, the other day, uh, the other one was uh, the, the two uh, breakaway province guys yeah. released their statements about how there was shelling and they were going to have to evacuate. Uh, they were evacuating civilians. Both of those had been made two days before they aired. Before huh. yes, before they said that we're being shelled and we need to evacuate civilians to Russia, both of those had been made uh, at the same time two days previously. So that was a mm -hmm. manufactured uh, set of circumstances. Yes, um, is there an accurate source of news out of Russia in terms of either mainstream or not mainstream? Um, I don't have one. Okay. Um, no, I, I I don't have. I, I probably there are. But I know so little about about who's on what side of things there, or who uh, yeah. you should or shouldn't trust. I will tell you that all Russian state media, even if you know, uh, like uh, RT, is Russian state media, even though it purports to be independent. It looks like a TMZ website. You know, it's all jazzy and fresh. Yeah. And you know, we're I'm used to the Soviet era news being one very serious man read news. That's yeah. all there was, right? But now yeah. they look very fresh and modern. Uh, but most of them are controlled by by Putin, by the state. So, right. uh, and and they're actually uh, they're having a real problem right now because Anonymous, uh, the, the the hacking collective, declared war on Russia, and they took RT off the air. They took several other big uh, media outfits in Russia off the air yesterday. Uh, two of them started suddenly playing you, you, annoying Ukrainian pop music. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so they're having a lot of trouble even staying on the air right now oh boy. Uh, without interference. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just going to put it out there then. If anybody does know of a reputable, accurate Russian news source, I'm interested. So send me messages. Yeah. Oh, Russ makes a good point. Always look for multiple sources. Yeah. Yeah. Always, always, um, always. Yeah, I know. Always, and the other thing is sometimes, especially in Twitter, uh, the multiple sources will go back to the same guy. So you have to be careful yes. that it's actually multiple sources and not just two OSINT uh, tw tw tweet accounts that are repeating the same uh, the same story. So yes. that that can happen. So that's that's all about following the paper trail, and that's that's a wormhole, really. But I mean, follow the paper trail. Find out where everything is coming from. Yeah, I want I know I want people to be especially skeptical skeptical of good news. I know that sounds weird, but, um, but the the other day when uh, uh, the report was that uh, that Zelensky had said I need ammunition, not a ride, when they when the Americans had offered to get him out of the country, yeah. I heard that quote at midnight. Um, but that was in the middle of uh, of severe ground attack in Kiev. There was a huge battle going on in the streets of the city, and earlier he had reported he was going out on patrol. Like, like every other Ukrainian guy, he and a patrol had gone out to make sure things were, you know, to fight in the battle. So I wasn't going to report that quote until I knew that Zelensky was still alive because you, you, as, as much attention as he's mm -hmm. gotten, rightfully so, if he did die, you might not want that to get out. You might want him to remain like the ghost of Kiev, right? So I was, until I saw him on video the next morning, I, I wasn't comfortable uh, putting in the group that he had said that. It's a great quote. It's it a, really it's, is. It's going to be an immortal quote. But uh, I wasn't comfortable putting it out there until we no. actually saw him breathing and talking. Because if he had been killed, holy crow, that would have looked bad. Yeah. So, like, yeah, just in all the ways. Um, okay, so let's say that I am on the social media, I'm hanging out, and there's a friend I know, I like, I trust, who is fairly intelligent, able to weed through things, posts a video that looks mostly legitimate, and I watch it, and I'm thinking, oh, geez, that's terrifying, and then I'm thinking, oh, hang on, it kind of, uh, am I sure? Am I sure? How do I know? How do I know if I'm looking at a video of war footage that isn't 
fabricated? Good question. And the first thing to do, and I, we all get warned, but don't look at the comments, you know, because we're afraid of the things we oh, have to read through. But, look but at the, the comments, comments uh, in the video that's posted are a really good first source. And, and I often, uh, that's where I find something isn't right. Uh, by going through the comments, not just somebody saying that's not what happened. Somebody will link, no, this is that sort. That's from 2014, and it happened during the first Kiev revolution. Right? There was a video that went around the other night that I was like, it was so shocking that I was ready to hit the share button. It was of a group of Ukrainians throwing Molotov cocktails at two armored vehicles in an urban environment. Like I mean, they were raining fire on these two vehicles, and they'd already set two on fire. And I was like ready to share that because we knew. There were Russian troops in armored personnel carriers in Kyiv. We knew Ukrainians had been building Molotov cocktails in a factory setting. And it, it, for, it really, it looked immediate. But it was from 2014. It's from a documentary called Winter on Fire from the first time this happened in Ukraine. So it's a thing that happened, but it's not a thing that was happening. And that's an important, right? You know, that's important. And yeah. that's exactly the point Zester is making in the comments. Lots of war footage is being shared uh, on on uh, as news on Twitter and Reuters fact checks on Twitter is a great is great for parsing truth. So there are lots of sources. So if you don't see it repeated by a, by a reputable news agency, or if you see them post in the comments, no, that's from 2014. That so the comments are actually a really good source of debunking. But let's re let's remember that that debunking is not necessarily also innocent. Somebody you know Russia doesn't want you to to know that they fired uh, multiple launch rocket system attacks on the people of Kharkiv today and killed hundreds and dozens of civilians and injured hundreds, but they did, you know, so they might say, oh, that's fake footage. That's something that Ukraine did to those people. It wasn't us. That's the fog of war. And we're not going to mm -hmm. conquer all of that. And, and propagandists count on you not being able to, to absolutely verify things. So they hope you'll be paralyzed into not sharing or you'll be sharing stuff stuff that they can then they can then later debunk themselves. They can plant the footage and then make you look like the idiot for having repeated that it was true. So that's yeah. that's challenging. Yeah, it's, super challenging. it's not as challenging as say I don't know getting attacked and shot at by the Russian army, but it's pretty challenging. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather <laughs> deal with fake news than get yeah. attacked, but it's not it's not easy. So. What are some things that you would watch for if you're looking at something and you're trying to figure out if somebody is manipulating you for an agenda? So whether you're looking at news or whether you're in the social media or whether you're in a chat room, what are the, say, top three things you'd look for, three things that you notice or feel that says, hey, this is definitely manipulative? Um, a, a, a post by a source that you follow that makes a specific claim that sounds compelling without any without any specific uh, uh, proof you know um, a, a cruise missile just hit a, a, a kindergarten in in Kharkiv with exclamation points be, be, mm -hmm. you know and without a link to footage of it or, or or a news source there are reporters on the ground in those places there are journalists on the ground reporting and you would think that the, that richard engel from nbc if he was in mariupol and that happened he would be working his way to the scene and you know talking to local officials to verify right yeah. um if it says local official says a kindergarten was bombed in kharkiv okay that's better but if it says local official Leonid, whatever last name, the, the city's mayor says, now that that's you know, now now we've got some some momentum rolling towards verifiability. Cause then you can go to that mayor's Twitter account and see if they in fact have reported that or verified that. So that's right. what is is, okay. is is the the nature of the the report itself can tell you a lot, right? Um the, the when I'm when I'm posting in our group that something has happened. It's because I've seen footage of it happening and people on the ground are also reporting it. Like I, this is a real thing. Earlier today, uh, Russia seems to have accelerated into creating mass casualty situations, something they seem to be avoiding and we weren't sure why. 
but they basically uh, an MLRS is a multiple launch rocket system. It looks like a truck with a giant box on the back of it that launches a whole bunch of missiles outgoing. And they've had those since World War II. They 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 were called Katusha rocket launchers in World War II. They've obviously been modernized, but those. We have those two MLRS. We use them in the Gulf War both times. Um, those rockets land with 250-pound explosive warheads uh, and cause lots of damage over a really limited area. But um, the other thing is that the, the report was they're launching cluster munitions, which are illegal to use in civilian environments. Uh, cluster munitions are little bomblets. Instead of a 250-pound warhead, it's 25 10-pound warheads or 251-pound hand grenade size warheads. So they burst over the, the scene and then drop all these small explosives all over the ground that are designed to destroy equipment. That's what they're made for. But when they're used in a civilian environment, clearly the damage is catastrophic. And okay. uh, so th they, we've been hearing that they were using cluster munitions in the city of Kharkiv. But after this particular attack, in addition to the, the mass casualty event it caused, the rocket sleeves that hold the cluster munitions have a certain different look, and they 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 break away from the from the explosives, and they and one of them was stuck in the ground. So people can look and see that yeah, that's a cluster munition rocket body stuck into the ground in a public street two blocks from where all the people died. Now we know Russia is using cluster munitions on the civilian population of Kharkiv. That's a war crime. So. We, you know, that that's how you verify these things. You, there's okay. some things that analysts know that we don't. And I mean, there's the reason people are taking close up pictures of these unexploded cluster munitions on the ground is because from the writing that's on them, you, you know, it, it basically says, you know, made in, you know, this factory, you can tell where it came from. And yeah. so it's pretty clear. Now, what the Russians would say is well they bought all those rocket launchers from us so it's actually the ukrainians that are killing people in the car in, in kharkiv and they will do that they'll put the report that ukrainians bombed kharkiv today that's why we're we have to go in and and it, that's why we have to attack ukraine is because they're killing russian speaking uh people in in eastern ukraine that's their yeah. whole basis for the war right yeah yeah Ugh. that's that's ugly. so that did that answer the question really that was sort of designed to unfold how you would you know so i saw yeah uh, the attack itself and the results of that attack and then immediately uh somebody posted a picture of the rocket body stuck in the ground so it's clear that not only did they attack russia a, a, a ukrainian civilian center um they did it with cluster munitions that's a war crime and that's going to be really important uh down the road yeah. if this turns out in such a way that that's prosecutable yeah definitely so okay so one way to tell you're being manipulated is if the information you're being given is not sourced and not particularly specific right okay so what's what's another how if when you are being manipulated how do you feel like when what, what feeling do you recognize before you say oh hey this is probably manipulation usually anger or elation okay. Right. Okay. If something makes me very happy to hear or something makes me very angry to hear. OK, so you, you any, know, any like automatic extreme of emotion of aha or. Yes. Yeah. OK. Right. Well, the ghost of Kiev story. Are you familiar with this? Um, I've heard of it, but I don't know details okay. in uh, in air combat terminology or or or, or culture uh, that uh, or very sad. Good. Yeah. Good point. Right. Uh, uh, there's an ace as a pilot who shot down five other aircraft. Right. Sometimes people fly years and never fire any missiles or guns at anybody. Uh, but an ace is an air combat warrior who's got five air to air kills in one day. Okay. Or, or in their career, ace in a day is someone who's actually gotten five kills in a single day. And that had not happened since the end of world war two. I don't even think in the Korean war, there were any, any ace in a day, uh, pilots and i can name a bunch of them because i'm a nerd but uh there's apparently a pilot in the ukrainian air force that became an ace in a day last week when when russia started mm -hmm. sending in aircraft a lot of aircraft he shot down he or she shot down five uh, enemy aircraft in one day we don't know their wow. name we don't know if they're real we don't know if this person is real 
and you know there's some air combat footage people filmed on the ground of dogfights and planes spinning to the ground but we won't know if that's true until after the war is over and there's good reason for not releasing this pilot's name because then what if somebody locates them what if the russians oh yeah know, they'd be targeted go after that airfield specifically because they want to they want to you know have a, a big propaganda victory of killing that person so yeah. we won't know until months from now maybe years from now who that pilot was if the story was even true if they made it up out of whole cloth just to have a hero you know there's a story about a famous russian sniper actually who's from the ukraine in the soviet era in world war ii named uh, uh, alexei zaitsev they made the movie enemy at the gates is loosely based on his story but he's a young farm kid who learned to shoot when he was a kid and became he killed 150 germans uh through the scope of a sniper rifle he's very real but he became a heroic figure to other russian soldiers it became proof that the germans weren't invincible that their officers were vulnerable and uh so i could see why the ukrainians might want to make up a guy like the uh the ghost of of kiev so that's yeah. uh, <laughs> huh. it may be propaganda but i swear i'm reposting every ghost of kiev meme i find so that makes me feel good when they when they say you know he shot down five russian aircraft in one day i'm like that's exciting that's that the ukrainians are actually doing some damage so i you know i i told that story but i told it with a very large grain of salt you know this yeah. guy may or may not be real but doesn't it feel good right yes. and so you know, goes to kiev you know it's it's scaring people so <laughs> yeah huh okay well this is yeah. this is all good to know so if i'm looking at a picture of data so let's say i'm not looking at an image of a tank burning in the street but i'm looking at an image taken from let's say some official source so maybe a photo or a screenshot uh, let's go screenshots a screenshot of a website but without any kind of a source to it so no url no real direction as to where it came from hmm. and i kind of have my my hunches that it's been photoshopped poorly how can I, as a person who might not question that information, realize that I'm looking at something dodgy? As I, mean, I don't not. think I don't think people. The way you ask that question, you ask that mm -hmm. question as a person that would never know. not know that they're probably being manipulated. So people that that repost that and repost that, they it's too late. <laughs> they've already they've already yeah. bought it. You know, they've already bit the sausage on that. So, so source it. Source yeah. everything. Right. Right, yeah. and you know, and, and another thing, some of these, 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 like the photo or the uh, the video clip of the cruise missile hitting the apartment building in Kiev the other day. Yep. There's ten or fifteen different angles of that event. You know, lots of people filmed that. That means that people all over the city, from different angles, saw the same thing happen. That you know, if there's more than one, uh, one image of what you saw happening, that's a good indicator, right? That okay, uh, that they're concurrently view. reported. And they appear to be from you know just a different spot, seeing the same thing. Um, there was a I, I posted this. We have a thread up on this in the group the other night. The first report from NBC News was flash ballistic missile shot down over Kiev, and and you know ballistic missiles are uh, could be scuds like were launched in the Iraq War or in the the first Gulf War uh, in Desert Storm, Desert Shield. Gosh, we have to keep track of which which Iraqi war we're talking about now. Um, so they can be short, medium, or intercontinental ballistic missiles. It's a rocket that goes up and then comes down on the target with a with a uh, with some sort of a warhead. Um, so the first report was from NBC News, and it was that a, a ballistic missile had been shot down, intercepted over Kiev. And the first thing that went through my mind is, I didn't know that the Ukrainians had any systems to shoot down ballistic missiles, like our mm -hmm. Patriot missile battery that we export to other places in the world. That's what it's for, but not thinking Ukraine had any of those that was that's what made that about that story made me sit up for a second and go what what and within an hour what we found out it was a very large uh Russian transport that was shot down and when you started seeing more and more footage of the debris falling from the sky as it was falling it was rotating and you could actually see the wing structure you could oh, see gosh. where the wings are so that's not a ballistic missile but no when NBC News leads with that Right, it kicked off a whole bunch of people to go. How likely is that? Number one, that the Russians are launching ballistic missiles into the city of Kiev. Number two, 
that the Ukrainians actually had something to shoot it down with, right? So that the, the skepticism often comes from knowledge of what systems are available and what they're capable of. Okay, so I have another manipulation question here. Um, yeah. Some of the news that's come out in the last 24 hours has been from a bunch of countries, NATO and non-NATO countries, saying our citizens are welcome to go fight for the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. Right. That's been big news. So as a citizen, if I don't want to go fight for Ukraine, if I, if I do, all right, great. If I don't, I feel like the publication of that news is trying to push people in a certain direction that they wouldn't normally. Like, I don't know. And this, this could just be me being completely new to the idea of war. But if right. I'm from a NATO country and my country says, yeah, you can totally go fight for their foreign legion. Firstly, how is that not a declaration of war? And secondly, how how are they not trying to manipulate me to do that by giving me permission? If I'm going to do it, I've already bought my plane ticket. I'm on my way over. I don't care right, what the but says. If the Ukrainians had not previously given you permission, you'd be turned away at the border. Hi, I'm an American and I want to come fight for your army at the airport. They're going to put you back on a plane to wherever you came from. Okay. But Ukraine did, in fact, say that they will take in, uh, citizens from any country that want to come and fight in defense of Ukraine. Um, so that's number one, right? So is okay. it a media manipulation? Well, it's a big deal for a country to do that. It's very unusual for a country to do that. Remember what a meal we made of the fact that that uh, that the Taliban, you know, had an American, one single American was was uh, was captured. And think about what a story that was, right? Yeah. Um, but I want to give you an example of what you're talking about, though, in a really positive context. Okay. When 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 Great Britain was under attack by Germany in 1939, 1940, and it was really obvious that so before war was declared, when it was really obvious that Germany was going to uh, widen the war, they were going to invade Poland. England's promise was that if Poland was invaded, they would declare war on Germany. And that's exactly what happened. But they knew for about six months that that was going to happen. There were Americans and Canadians and probably South Africans and Australians who were not formally part of the, of the United Kingdom's military structure who wanted to go and be ready to defend England should Germany attack. So uh, there, there were enough Americans uh, individual volunteers that were welcomed into the United Kingdom and they formed a special RAF squadron called Eagle Squadron that was all American pilots and there were other squadrons that were filled up with uh, pilots from other non-belligerent countries that just wanted to defend England and they fought in the Battle of Britain and, and were part of the successful defense of England from, from German bombing raids. Uh, so that's a thing that's always happened. Uh, yeah. The Abraham Lincoln Brigade in the Spanish Civil War that were anti-fascists that went and fought on the side of the communists in the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. So there's a long history of, of people being inspired by what they're seeing and wanting to go. And I, I don't know that you'll ever stop that. Um, no, I wouldn't want to. But I'm I'm just, I feel strange that it's a thing that my government would have to give me permission to do. It's nice that they did. Right, right. But... Well, it wouldn't be your government. It would be the Ukrainian government that would give you yeah, permission. Yeah, well, right? that's the thing, though, is that my government did give permission. Oh, they're saying if you apply they're for saying a visa, it's, we'll They're saying it. it's okay, you can go do it. And that's, well, what I, that's what I find kind of strange. Well, I don't think... I've been around a while, you know, mm -hmm. got some gray hair. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen a more black and white case for defending a country. Like, I, you know, yeah. uh, this, is a, this is a really, a, a really bright black and white line between what's right and what's wrong. And oh, yeah. I think folks are going to be inspired by that. And that includes the people that approve visas. You know, they're no less inspired True. than us by what they're seeing or, or angered by what they're seeing. So True. I can, you know, these are at the end of the day, human decisions. And, uh, you know, I don't think that you're, you're foreign, you guys have a foreign minister. Oh yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Yep. So, you know, I don't think your foreign minister made that decision by themselves. I think oh, they no. probably made that decision after consultation with the cabinet, uh, down here, that would be a cabinet level decision, not necessarily a legislative decision. So, um, yeah. I, I, is it manipulative? Sort of, but it, not necessarily for badness, but I, yeah, yeah you know, I mean, only use I, your, your powers for good. That's, yeah. uh, 
superhero motto. So, yeah, I'm finding I'm finding the whole thing very interesting. Um, all right. So what is something that we absolutely need to know about disinformation? Because that's a little bit different than I'm thinking of something different than fake news. I'm thinking of somebody saying something and it gets passed around often enough with less questionable sources to the point where right. people think that it's a thing. Right. Active measures, right? Um, yeah. Well, it, we, we didn't talk for long before the show, but one of the things I mentioned is how eye-opening for me reading the Mueller report was. There are pages upon pages of exhibits from the Mueller report of active disinformation performed by um, the Russian military specifically that you know i expected when i looked through those exhibits i would find a whole bunch of pro trump anti hillary uh uh you know ads that were run on facebook or memes that were shared on facebook or groups of people that were working toward that goal on facebook but what i found instead was there were a whole bunch of pro black lives matter posts and a whole bunch of of uh, pro um uh, uh, uh oh the city of missouri where they had the, the police shot that young man for jaywalking and uh, you know, like there was, there was just as much left-leaning propaganda posts and angering posts as there were right-leaning, and that's the, the the point. The chess game isn't uh, people. You know, the the statement uh, Putin loves Trump is not accurate, right? The 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 phrase Putin sees Trump winning as useful to his long-term goals is accurate. And so, you know, uh, that that's the thing is that the, the, the chess game for Putin isn't, you know, that it would be bad if Biden won. It would be bad if America was unified. That's the goal here. The goal here is us disunified and hating each other and yelling at each other. And the same with European countries, the same with us and European countries. He wants us fractured because he understands that if we're all unified, um, I don't know, the ruble might crash and the stock market might not open and everybody would shut off the oil valves in their airspace, right? Or he might be personally sanctioned. He the, Exactly mm -hmm. what he's afraid of is what's happening today. And I would remind everybody that it, it's happening because uh, we took a four-year break from punishing Putin for anything. We took an eight-year break. And I have to go back to even to the Obama administration. When the Crimea was invaded, we didn't really do anything. You know, there wasn't really a consensus that this was a bad thing. Why? I don't know. Those were Russian speaking people. And he could have made a case that, you know, that they need. It was pretty transparent to me because strategically I could see why they would want the Sea of Azov and the, the ports and all that down there in Crimea. But we didn't do anything. And, and that was the Obama administration. And I have to say that. But the thing that I'm seeing happen right now is. Um, the people in the Biden administration at the highest level now that are making decisions about these sanctions and, and our actions, often many of them were people that were part of that administration before Trump that learned some valuable lessons and they're not letting it happen again. Like the idea of releasing information to the, uh, to the American people almost in real time about what we knew. And I have to say they were right about... <laughs> almost everything down to timing as far as no he's building a force to invade ukraine it's not going to be a thing where he's only going to put troops in those two provinces he's looking to take all of ukraine the american intelligence was believed by the people in the white house and disseminated by the people in the white house decisions were made that were much better and i love that that we learned some valuable lessons we took a four-year break from learning valuable lessons about believing russians and and we got where we got and i don't want anybody to forget that the phone call that got Donald Trump impeached the first time was the phone call where Zelensky said, we're almost ready to buy more Stinger missiles, uh, Mr. President. And Donald Trump said, well, do us a favor, though. And what he asked for was dirt on his political opponent, Joe Biden. You know, he, he basically held him over a barrel and withheld that funding for months and months and months and finally was pressured into giving that funding and even then, in Congress, 53 of 54 Republicans voted not to give that funding to Ukraine. That's now, uh, you know, three years ago. What if all those weapons had been in place before now? Would, would Putin have still made the same calculation 
as far as the, 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 the efficiency or wisdom of invading Ukraine. Let's not forget that we've been manipulated, that yep. we have been controlled and manipulated by Russian propaganda um, at some pretty high levels for a pretty long time. So as, as a one individual, how, what can I do to make things better from a disinformation perspective? Just be, be vigilant about it. Make sure that the things you share are accurate, uh, as accurate as you can. If you don't, mm -hmm. if you don't, if you don't know, don't share it. You know, yeah. that, that maybe that's the best bellwether kind of attitude to take. I, I see this video. It seems important that people know, but is it, is it accurate? You know, if you're not sharing accurate information, Satan wins. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 been my, that's been my test. Uh, yeah. Satan wins if we share inaccurate information. Uh, and I don't necessarily personify Satan as, as Putin. I don't think he's that important or, or that Satan is real, but uh, am I helping Am I helping the the enemy? And in this case, it's pretty clear to me who, and it should be to everybody, who the enemy is. App apparently, it's not though. Uh, some people are convinced that uh, Putin's right. This is all about his uh, his rights to control his own territory. And uh, I will remind people that there were southern states that said the same thing here in America in the 1860s. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, that's not. <laughs> it's not, that's not, it's not okay. Works. Ukraine really is a country with its own culture and language and history. Uh, that's older than, by the way, than the history of Moscow. So, yep. yeah, um, yeah, uh, Donna Van Meter. I think anyone letting anyone go to fight Ukraine opens the door for private security companies to join, like Blackwater, et cetera. That's true, but we're, you know, as far as individual citizens go, um, they're inviting foreign citizens to come fight for them. So, I'm pretty sure if Blackwater said uh, President Zelensky would want to send a a hundred guys, he would not say no because that's a really desperate fight and they need everybody. They're releasing prisoners uh, this week that, that you know, if you sign an agreement that you will go and fight in the defense forces, uh, they're releasing prisoners in Ukraine. So it's Dang. serious. It's, 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 it, I can't, that, I, it's a desperate fight. Even though it looks like Ukraine is winning right now, it is a desperate fight. And they, the, you know, they do not have nearly as much guns and butter as the Russians have. So... Well, that's that's something to keep in mind too. Is that it is it is on the edge? Yeah, it's easy. We want to be optimistic, uh, but we're not at the end of this. You know, this no, is, and and Russia hasn't brought its A game. They haven't. They're fighting with one hand tied behind their back, and lots of analysts are wondering why that is. Um, I think there's a squeamishness about about mass civilian casualties, not yep. because they're civilians, but because they're first cousins. You know, they didn't have any compunction about bombing yeah. a shit ton of brown people in Syria or other places. And frankly, we're not exactly innocent of that either. But uh, I think the hesitancy is that, you know, the generals that are leading this effort are old enough to have grown up in the Soviet era. And they've never seen the Ukrainian people as their enemy. Right. They in World War Two, yeah. you know, Ukraine, Ukraine was a battlefield. Uh, that that Soviet Union troops fought over, and lots of Ukrainians and Russians shed blood together in Ukraine in World War II. Uh, so I think it might be possible that some of the generals are dragging their feet, that some of the unit commanders are, are squeamish about shooting civilians or firing into a place they've been told to fire into. Um, but I don't know how long that can last before those officers are removed and replaced with people that have no compunction about firing you know, large numbers of rockets into civilian centers. And by the way, Gerasimov, we think, was fired yesterday by, by Vladimir Putin, who was the, the chief of staff of the army. So, you know, I think that may be a thing that's happening, that, that there's, they're hardening uh, their resolve. And they definitely have uh, the capability, with, even without nuclear weapons, to kill tens, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian civilians. So, uh, yeah, not, we're, we're not even near the middle yet. So... Well, that's frightening. Yeah, uh, Zestra says, Scott Hicks reported some of the Russian fighters were not aware they were going uh, to war, but instead thought they were on an exercise. That's true. Those were mostly, my guess is, conscript troops. You can be, you know, thumped over the head and dragged into the military in Russia. Uh, usually when you're going to go into war, they make you sign a contract so that if you do die, they don't have to pay a pension for you or notify your family. Uh, and so some of these these small units were literally not aware they were in Ukraine until stuff started bouncing off the outside of their vehicle uh, and surrendered immediately. 
or made the decision to surrender once they figured out they were being asked to fire on Ukrainians. So that's a problem. But the big, like the guards, tank armies and, and huge motorized infantry regiments, they are going to be much harder and they will know. And, and those are the units that are now snaking their way into Ukraine and towards Kiev. So um, I don't know. Uh, it's, I'm not optimistic. I want to be. And sometimes I believe things uh, because I want to be optimistic. And we all do. And that's how disinformation gets to you. Was there a question at the beginning of that? That's tough. Well, yeah, it was how, how can to, I as an individual combat disinformation? And I think he just kind of hit the nail on the head. We we do have a tendency to want to be optimistic, and right there's a balance. Pat, we, we, we want to we, we want our our beliefs reinforced. Yes. So if we, yes. we're pessimistic, there you go. pessimistic information. You see, I told you that was not going to be a good thing. Optimistic information. You know what I mean? So we want our yeah. view, re, our feeling reinforced. Okay. And we have to be careful so, of that question about has anyone heard what's happening with all the protesters being arrested in Russia and that brings to mind another question of, as a as a journalist the responsibility to both show the protesters so that they are visible so that somebody you know is aware if they suddenly disappear hmm. but do you show the protesters because if you show their faces then reprisals who they are yeah that's a tough call, and I, I don't I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I, will, I I know that uh, I, a number of the analysts and people I'm following are literally in bunkers under Kiev. You know what I mean? They're working. Uh, they go out for an hour or two and make observations, come back and get on the internet and report what they've seen. Um, they're aware of protests all over the world. They're aware that that thousands of Russians are being arrested. Uh, you know, combating the the idea that that attacking them is good. So. I think that that showing those protests is important to the people of Ukraine. Um, I think it's important for mutual self-support. Like it makes me very happy to know that Jacksonville, Florida yesterday lit up their, their huge bridge in blue and yellow as we did here on the Skyway Bridge. So, uh, you know, it reinforces that we're on the, the side of goodness. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that we're careful of in, in my group is we're not showing Russian POWs because their families could be punished. You know, the Russian army may go punish their family because they surrendered. Um, right. So we're being very careful not to show individual Russian soldiers who have been captured. Uh, I've seen, we've seen them. You know, we you can go on Twitter and you can find a video of them saying exactly what oh, was yeah. reported, right? Uh, but we're not re, we're not reposting those those videos and images because we don't want their families to uh, uh, to be punished. That's a really good point. So then we do have to be careful about what we're sharing. And if we hear the stories, the stories are okay, but right. not the details. And if there's geolocation information and photos, I can assume that it exists in videos as well. Yep. Yep. Uh, interviews. So, they've done, they've been interviewed. And, and the, the story I related was a, an NCO, a guy in his like late twenties who he wasn't informed. They just went on maneuvers, go this way, go that way, go this way, wait, 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 go this way. And then all of a sudden, People started shooting at his vehicle, and they didn't have any idea uh, why. They thought it might have been friendly fire at first. They thought somebody else might have accidentally fired at them, and then they figured out that, no, no, Ukrainians are trying to kill us, and they all Jeez. get out of the vehicle and put their hands up uh, yeah. like, you, like you would, right? Right. Uh, so they're not supermen, right? These are not, these, these are not monsters. These are human beings. Uh, at the lowest level, the conscript level, they're very young. They can be as young as 16 years old. Uh, they are badly fed. Uh, they are badly cared for. They are often beaten by their officers. Russian Russian military life for enlisted men is horrifically bad. And, it, it, you know, I can imagine uh, once you do figure out you're in Ukraine, when you look around and you see all these people that are well-fed, that have electricity, that, you know, are not being beaten by their officers, you might be tempted to just sneak off. And yeah. uh, that, And we've seen that happen. But I, I think there are other units behind these that are much harder, much more uh, attuned to it, much more ready for it. Um, and it may be that, you know, that these conscript units have been basically used to find the Ukrainian forces. Like you walk the, you walk the young inexperienced guy out through the minefield. Don't walk where he walked when he blows up, you know. Yeah, the canary uh, in the mine shaft. Yeah, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. I think, essentially what they've been used for, which is horrific. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think Russian moms are going to be really, really mad about that. Um, so 
I guess we'll see how it goes. So, yeah, wow. Want to give away some stuff? Yeah, let's give away some stuff. All right, we got a few people in the in the uh, chat buffer here. I've got five. I got four. Uh, uh, we're gonna have an acronym game, okay? Okay. And what I have to give away is, I, let me see. Can I show one of these on? Can I screen share? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. um, the very first uh, NFT that Corey made was a uh, was a meme that I made for Shipple. Uh, and it was uh, basically we were, it was designed to be like uh, propaganda posters for for Shipple, the Shipple Charity Flying Circus. You know, make memes, do good, take naps is is the motto. And he made a hundred of these. He minted a hundred of these. The very first NFT he ever made related to any of the projects that I've been involved in with him. And he made uh, this this NFT set of this image right there. And I have four of those to give away. There are only a hundred of them ever made. It's not part of a like a verified collection or anything. It's just, uh, it's just a thing. And I and I I'm keeping the the low number ones. I, I, I'm I'm giving away from you know from the middle set. I have number one. And I think I gave Corey number two. And so we're keeping the the low mint number ones. But I've got four of those to give away for the people that come up with the correct answer to the acronym quiz. Okay, we're gonna start with a really easy one. So if you have the answer correct, then we'll get your uh, your your wax wallet address, and we will I will ship these off to you today. Um, the first one's super easy, super easy. Okay, okay. what does NATO stand for? N A T O NATO. And how much time are we giving people to answer? I, I don't know. Ooh, is that stressful? <laughs> I don't know. We'll give it a minute. Yeah, I don't see a lot of comments. That's the thing. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give away no NFTs today. That's how this is going to go. So does anybody know how to use Google? Because I know how to use Google. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Gail got it right. All right. Oh, Donna got it. I don't know who got it. For... Oh, it's a tie. So I'm going to give away two. Oh, cool. and we've okay. got... Yeah, we got one in there from the love handles too. So <laughs> the All love right. handles. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it. Yep. All right. So I, I've got I've got spares. It's good. Awesome. Uh, okay. North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is the organization of European countries and most of North American countries, uh, that is a, a mutual protection pact to protect those countries from attack by what was the Soviet Union and what is now more and more. Russia by itself and its and its few allies. Uh, it was the 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 uh, the critical part of the treaty says that an attack on any one member state of NATO is an attack on all. And uh, I I use this one because Donna says she's got one already, so we're good. Um, the uh, oh yeah, she did get it wrong. She said North American Treaty Organization. That's not correct. Uh, essentially, the the Putin is trying to make this about Ukraine's NATO membership. But it's not. Uh, but here's the thing. If if Ukraine were to join NATO, he would not have the option of attacking them without consequence. And clearly there's been consequence. But people are saying, why can't we put an air cap over Ukraine, no-fly zone over Ukraine? That would be an act of war. Because if a Russian plane shot down a Polish plane or a, you know, a, a an American plane or an English plane or a French plane or any of the other 27 member states, there would be a war between us and Russia and that might end in a nuclear exchange. So that's a, a huge uh, stopping point for both sides to involve, get involved in a direct shooting war. Um, so NATO is designed to act in the event of an attack on any of the countries that are member states. Right? And that's good fun. news, little countries like Poland and Lithuania and Latvia are now NATO members. Um, and uh, that means that if he were to attack them tomorrow, there would be a much wider war. And that's something he can't afford unless his plan is to use nuclear weapons, in which case, you know, yeah. Uh, that, yeah. I, we don't want to go too far down that road, but NATO, no. North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Good oh. job. All right, they, they get tougher from here. Oh boy. Um, All right. Yeah, as hard as th that one was to get an answer on, let's see. Um, the next acronym is, I'm gonna put it in the comments too, GRU. And all of these, by the way, are related to the the countries involved in the story in Ukraine. I know what a GRU is, but I don't know the long form. <laughs> you mean a GRU like from Dungeons and Dragons? This is an acronym, though, so it's not that. 
Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah, no, I, I'm going to have to wait and see what everybody comes up with because now I'm curious too. <laughs> no, that's not right. Why well, somebody else is always thinking Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah. Let's give it another second. Okay. Oh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give an answer on this one. I guess it's the GRU is the Russian Military Intelligence Directorate. That's the people that uh, actually manipulate the, the the people that manipulated our election by posting memes and uh, and interfering with our election. That we we know now that the Russian military is who was hacking, uh, who probably hacked the DNC. We even know <laughs> somebody somebody went to Google. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. It's the Russian military intelligence agency. It would be a, a, a equivalent to our defense intelligence agency in the United States. So, yeah. Um, and we, by the way, that's the, we we knew uh, in the Mueller report. We know exactly what desk they sat at. That's how well penetrated they were when we finally got around to looking. That uh, we knew what office in Saint Petersburg and what desk they each sat at when they were spending hours sending misinformation, disinformation uh, related to our election process. Now looking back, that looks like an act of war. Actually, that, that there's an argument to be made that that they you know we, it was called m election meddling which is hilarious because meddling is not, it was an act of war. It would be like us stuffing ballot boxes in their elections, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. That's okay. Uh, gosh, I thought that was, uh, I, I don't know, I think I made this too hard. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Uh, VDV. VDV. Victor yep. Delta Victor. Yep. Okay. That's an interesting Google response. Vosdushno de Santie Vosca Rossi. Airborne troops. There you go. Sestra got it. First go. Yep. Did you know that or did you look it up? <laughs> Either way, Sestra's getting the uh, getting a shipple meme. Nice. Okay. Uh, last one. And it, it actually has a, it has NATO as the first part of it. Okay. NATO. Where'd it go? DJTF. Oh, cool. She didn't look it up. She heard it this morning. Nice. Well, that's impressive. Yeah, that's all the Russian paratroop units, equivalent of our like uh, 82nd Airborne, 101st Airborne, and Army Rangers. Anybody know what the VGTF is? Well, I just looked it up, so I don't count for other reasons too. But so, and I got, I've got a, I've got a. One of the things that my pet peeve is when when reporters get things wrong. Right when, or when they say something that is really ambiguous and it sounds huge, um, Google, yeah, uh, the yeah Joint Task Force. You know, you're close. This is the the quick reaction Joint Task Force. So there's always been a Joint Task Force. That's the people that that command military operations by NATO uh, that rotates. Sometimes it's an American commander, sometimes it's a Dutch commander or a German commander. You get the idea. But this task force, this is a, a fast reaction task force. This is a set of troops that are on high alert at all times and ready to move really quickly and it, you can see this is a situation where they might be needed because it, let's say that the russians just decide today is lithuania's day we would want to very fast because they're a nato member we'd really quickly want to move troops out in front of them to keep them from taking lithuania so this quick reaction force or joint uh, task force uh, quick reaction joint task force is part of the joint task force of nato so you're close i think we'll probably give it to you uh but the thing to know about it is what i've been hearing is it's the first time it's been deployed in nato history it's only existed since 2012. this very fast reaction task force has only existed for about 10 years so it sounds like you know in the history of nato well the, the whole idea only originated in 2012. so it's a big deal but it's not like uh 
you know, it's not like Sweden donating missiles to, to Ukraine, which has never happened in the history of of Western Europe, or Germany changing their stance and sending uh, lethal weapons to Ukraine, which they have not done since uh, joining NATO at the end of World War II. Uh, so, you know, that would be that. That's the thing I'm saving. That's a big deal for things like that. Uh, but yeah, the yeah, the the fast joint uh, task force reaction force has been deployed. So a lot of the air traffic that you're seeing now in Eastern Europe, it's 40,000 troops, plus all of their equipment, which would include hospitals and vehicles and anti-aircraft defenses and communications gear is all being moved right now, uh, may already be in Eastern Poland. So they're close to where the front lines are in this war. And I think, you know, by way of, uh, by way of the thing where I don't want us to be overconfident or optimistic, there's still always the chance that uh, Russian soldiers fire the wrong way and land a missile among American troops in Poland or in a city in Poland, um, you know, not even a nuclear missile, but any attack on the forces that are arrayed around Ukraine right now could be considered an act of war. And I think the most likely flashpoint for right, that right now is in the North Sea, where they have a massive naval presence and there's a lot of commercial shipping. They've already accidentally or on purpose uh, fired on four or five commercial vessels. Uh, one of which was Turkish. Turkey is a NATO country. That could be considered an act of war or even an act of Etsy piracy, which would be an act of war. Um, now, Turkey controls the Bosporus, which is the, uh, the, the complicated system of, of uh, waterways that goes from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. And they've, they're considering shutting that off to Russian naval traffic. If the Russians decide that they have to have that passage open and they attack Turkey, Turkey is a NATO country. That's an act of war. So I think that's probably the, the flashpoint that scares me the most right this minute is all of the shipping going back and forth across uh, the Black Sea. Did I say the North Sea at some point in there? I think I did. You did. The Black Sea, yeah, the, Black sea and, uh, and, uh, the Sea of Azov connect to the Mediterranean. And I think that's the, the Black Sea is probably a place uh, where something bad like that could happen. Of course, with all those aircraft flying around without transponders, it's also possible that a Russian aircraft or an American aircraft or a, could get it wrong and fire it, you know, an enemy uh, aircraft and cause a war. That's a concern. And we, we, you know, we have to be really cognizant of the fact that when you say, when, when people say things like, oh, we should, we should put a no fly zone over Ukraine. No, no, we, you know, we can't. If we did, and, uh, you know, they were going to attack, they would have to shoot those planes down. And if they shoot down American planes, we are now in a war with Russia, which has nuclear consequences. And uh, by the way, France and England also have nuclear weapons and they are NATO countries. So, you know, it's horrifying and frustrating to watch uh, Ukrainians being killed on the ground, knowing that it's Russian aircraft that are doing vast amounts of damage. Um, maybe we should have let them into NATO when they asked the first time eight years ago. Maybe we shouldn't have listened to Trump when he said that NATO was useless and that it served no purpose and we should quit. Um, just my, yeah. just my personal opinion. Maybe we should have listened when Ukraine asked us for the for the for help in 2014 and we said we couldn't. So, yeah. yeah. There you go. Lots to think about. Yeah. Well, thank you very, very much. This has been awesome and Certainly. a couple of really good takeaways for how to how to spot your accurate information and your less accurate information right so I hope everybody's been paying attention to that and listen uh, you know if you know me and i'm on your facebook friends list uh you can message me and, and you know i won't tell you i know if i don't i'll you know i'll go look if you find something that you want to share that you think is uh is suspect good that's the first that's that's a good answer i don't i don't know if this is real is this real good that's a good question it's the best question you can ask so yeah absolutely yeah. All right. And for anyone who are would be our contest winners, um, you can put your wax address here in the comments. It is um, it will show up with a replay of the video as a live chat. Um, so it doesn't look like the video has comments, but it does show up when you rewatch it. Or you can send either of us a direct message in any of the many ways you know how to find us. Um, we're wondering who you are on Twitter. Can we share that information? Boom. There it is. So local Pasco. Excellent. And my profile picture on Twitter, Twitter is me and Corey. So yeah, easy to <laughs> you find. Just click the profile picture. If you see me or Corey, you'll know you got the right account. 
<laughs> excellent, excellent. And if anybody is trying to get in touch with Greg, you can also ask me. I have contact information. So, yeah. Awesome. And no, I'm, I'm not going to Ukraine to uh, take up arms against the Russians. I'm grateful to I, you. I'm just fat and old and I'd get in the way. So I'll stay over here and uh, be smart. You're, you're good at what you do over here. That's necessary, too. <laughs> Uh, yeah. The last thing, I'm not an expert. I'm a well-read yep. civilian. You know, I've never served in any capacity in uh, in military intelligence, but I've been paying attention for a very long time, and I'm connected to people that do. So, if I, if you know, my my knowledge comes from people far more knowledgeable about this than me, and uh, you know, that's I want to make sure I say that I'm not I'm not an expert, but I know some. So, that's that's very much how I feel. Yeah. Glad to know you. And yeah, you too. By extension, all the people you know who influence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's quite a circle we swim in, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They all make me proud every day. That's wonderful. Ah, okay, so with that dose of feel good, we're going to take off here. We'll see everybody. I'll see everybody tomorrow. And have a great rest of your whatever. It's Monday. Monday. Later.